I'm talking about security automation, so let's get into the topic of security first. Um, when I started my IT career somewhere shortly after 2000, I um, set up my first web server. I think it wasn't even a virtual one, it was still like real steel. Somewhere I put on my own website, of course, yeah, and five websites of my friends. And they were running on the, on the web server in some data center, so somewhere small one. And uh, of course I wanted to know how many visits do I have. Yeah, of course you want to know. That was before Google Analytics, so no way of putting in Google Analytics. I did a log, log parser, so I looked over the log files and to see how many people were coming in. And yeah, it was about a good day was five visits to all of those five websites. Yeah, so maybe 10, but half of that was me doing some updates. Yeah, and checking on that. So that was my effort on having a web server, but I was a, a junior uh, uh, web admin and, and developer, so I wanted to have the experience to do that. I set up uh, also a mail server and did my own mails there and stuff like that. I also set up at that time a tool called Logwatch, still exists, nice tool, you can use it. And it looks into all the log files of the complete system and it does like a, a daily excerpt of every log file and sends you everything that has been interesting, like who logged in or uh, what was happening in the, in the system every day. So I got from day one, I got like uh, excerpts from the log files and I looked over that and I realized that at least 10 times the traffic I had on the website was by people scanning my server, trying to break in via different root passwords, like trying to see if my mail server was a, like an open relay and they could send their spam over or something like that, scanning for FTP. So also on my website, uh, a lot of traffic, when, the days when I had a lot of traffic, that was when someone was scanning and trying to see if I have like uh, updated my, my uh, CMS system or something like that. I see some, somebody nodding here, so they know exactly what I'm talking about. So, and since I am, I'm still um, having my own website and it's still not very often used, which is okay for me, yeah, but um, I learned like the hard way from day one uh, where I did my own private thingy that security is definitely an issue I have to care about. So if I, I miss out on that, I'm going to be like really in a bad spot. So that was from virtually day one, I did my own thingy. So, and, um, no, it's not working. Let's see. Yeah, it's working, okay. So, um, and I'm going to talk to you uh, about security and I call that disclaimer because I'm not a hacker. I never hacked into any system. Yeah, I'm not a pen tester, yeah? So I never did any penetration testing or stuff like that. So I'm just a simple developer that started out on the web by like chance, more or less, and that grew into that. Nowadays, I work for Bizno Germany, uh, and uh, I'm very happy to work together with iQuest here, so um, I do that, but I still, if I run around with open eyes, I have to deal with security every damn day, yeah? So, and my take on security is that security is a lot more important than we can leave it to the, to the experts. So we have a security manager, but I'm not in a position as a developer to say, hey, this let the security manager take care of that, or let the uh, operators take care of that, yeah, or sysadmin guys or something. By the way, who of you think yourself are more in the de developing uh, field? So just to get a take, who is like, says, I, I, I'm a developer, and who is like operational guy? So sysadmin, yeah, great. I hope Linux, <laughs> great, <laughs> like that. So, okay, so mostly developers. So if you're developers, I, I beg you, think about security from the start to the end, uh, because that's like where we need to be. 
So, and especially in my company I work for, so we've been like a publishing house. So, Biznote Germany belongs to a big group of Biznote companies all over Europe. We have like 19 countries where we have like Biznotes in, but every country has like its own thing because uh, we were selling like for a long time data. We're sending, selling data about companies, data about people, also in several countries where you can like get marketing data. So if you get like uh, 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 um, um, a mail in your post letter box, that might be because of us. So I'm sorry about that. Yeah. So if you get like uh, advertisement mails or something like that. Also, uh, if you do in Sweden, for example, a contract for a mobile phone, that's you get it because of us. Yeah. Or you don't. Yeah, so sorry about that as well. Same on companies. So we, that's that's kind of the thing we deal in. And in Germany, the company Biznote started out as a publishing house. So they were like printing books, you know, these things in paper that you carry around and are pretty heavy. Yeah. So and then later they produced CDs and sent out CDs. Yeah. You know, these round silvery thingies. Okay. Yeah. I, I, you get that. Okay. So we were doing that. And Biznote was mainly thinking of itself like a publishing house and was thinking about IT. That these are the guys that are making my computers run so that I can write these pesky emails that I have to answer right away. Yeah? So that was how Biznote thought about IT until 10 years ago. Yeah? So for a pretty long time. So, and then 10 years ago, 12 years ago, there was a new CEO and he understood that basically Biznode is an IT company. And until then, we had a lot of software, we had databases and everything, but they were like basically monolithic systems. You couldn't like maintain them properly. If there was something done, it was copied. And so it was really, I'm, I'm being honest, it was a mess at the time. And when we did that jump into digital transformation, uh, I was pulled into the company. Of course, I wasn't one of the bad guys that did the bad systems before. I'm one of the good guys that are repairing the system and getting up to speed, of course. Um, but I was pulled into the company then, and we were trying to switch to newer technologies, uh, also to attract developers, like you said it before, that like the technologies we use are getting the, the people to come to, to, uh, to work for us. So we're doing microservices now, we're using Docker for deployment, we have a Kubernetes, we're going to move that uh, into this, the, the Amazon cloud soonish. So we're all like doing the hip stuff now. But we still have to maintain a lot of old, I have like in Germany alone, I'm, I'm responsible for around 30 websites, uh, a lot of Perl stuff, CGI and so on, and some new fancy ones with Angular. And uh, as I said, for us, since we're also the selling uh, personal data, uh, GDPR is a big thing. So, and since that came about, we had to like care about security a lot. So we cared a lot already, but management understood that we, they had to care about security as well, because otherwise it will be very costly, as you all know, or should know. So, well, it's not changing now. So, um, our security management that we installed back in the time had clear goals. They were saying, yeah, you have to care about security all the time, guys. Security is important. Yeah, we have to like protect the privacy of our customers. Even before GDPR, we tried to do that. Um, please establish some standards. So that's basically management talk, yeah. You as a developer and I as a developer know that this management talk does not make me happy, yeah? So it's not helping me any. I need to document stuff. What do I need to document exactly? What does it mean to establish standards? What do I have to do? All these things. So I need, as a developer, a specified task. I need to say, okay, there is an HTTP header that's not present uh, in the website right now, or the cookie is not protected, or you didn't, in that input field, you have a, a vulnerability because I can input a JavaScript and it then gets executed on your website, stuff like that. That makes me happy because then I know what to do. If I get something like, yeah, make your website secure, that does not help me at all. That's just another chore I have and I don't know how to solve. So. 
Our problem was exactly how were well we getting into concrete tasks for the developers to get a better level of security. So and what I'm showing you here is uh, part of the steps that we're doing there that might solve a par uh, part of these problems. So what I'm showing you is how to scan your web application, how to do that automatically. Yeah, so it's pretty easy, uh, actually. You have, of course, to learn a little bit of things and to, to um, yeah, do these things and, and get your knowledge up to speed if, if you're not already there. So you have to do a lot of, of uh, uh, work on the side, but that will help you to get into like concrete tasks that you find, that you can execute. You will have a way to measure how many alerts you get after a scan on your website. You can see how you improve on that. At least that's what we're hoping, because we're not 100% there yet. We have the scanning tools, we have what I show you. We do not have it completely uh, implemented into our, our development process. So, and that's what I want to share here. So what we do is uh, we take the OWASP Z attack proxy. Anybody heard about that tool? Z attack proxy? Yeah, you guys. My team, so they know it. <laughs> yeah, but no, okay. Anybody know what OWASP is? Yeah, great. Okay, so I'll, I need to, to tell a little bit. OWASP is like uh, an organization that cares about security. It is non-profit, yeah, and it is internationally working. So anytime you want to check out something on uh, security, go to the OWASP website, check out that. They have a lot of projects there. One of the major projects they have is the Z attack proxy. The Z attack proxy is a tool that helps you analyze your web traffic to see how many security flaws are in there. I'm going to run the web, uh, uh, the Z attack proxy for you, or ZAP as we call it, and I'm going to show you a little bit on that. So um, the best thing is ZAP produces a report in the end, and this report you can go through. Of course, there will be like false positives. You would say big security issue and it isn't, of course it will miss some. So it's not as good as a real hacker, but it's a lot better than not doing anything. So that's why we were starting out with that. And apart from the scanning thing, we also do like a lot of stuff. We're doing regular uh, security trainings for development. I'm preparing an uh, OWASP top 10 talk right now where I will like go from development uh, team to development team to do that. We're doing uh, code reviews based uh, also on, on security issues. We're training people, uh, sending people to trainings to, to get there. So you have to do a lot of things uh, on the side beside that. So Zap is not going to help you to do only this and then you're safe. So uh, don't think about it like that. So how does Zap work? Yeah, I guess everybody knows how a browser and a server interact. So the browser sends like an HTTP request to the server, get something HTTP somewhere on that host. So that's how it, how it goes. And the server, of course, answers with usually an HTML page first, and then you load the images and the JavaScript and the CSS and all this stuff. So when you want to use Zap, you start up an application called Z Attack Proxy or Zap, and you have to sorry you have to configure your browser to use Zap as a proxy. So what does that mean? That means that every request I send will not go directly to the target, but it will go to the Z Attack Proxy, and the Z Attack Proxy can analyze the request, and then it will send the request to the original place, like any proxy. Yeah. And then, of course, the server answers, and the ZEP analyzes the answer. That's the main part where the report will come from, and then it sends the answer to my browser. And then I can click through the application. Every request goes through the Z attack proxy, and after like half an hour of browsing, I have a very complete image of the thing the website can send out and do. Also, Z attack proxy has like an attack mode. After you like discover the page, you can tell that like, go do your worst. And there is like SQL injection tests. There is uh, cross-site scripting tests in there. There's a whole ton of plugins you can load to make it better. It can crawl the website, uh, look for, for directories, stuff like that. 
So you can configure it to be very complex if you want to. So I would like to show you the Z-Attack proxy. I hope it's still running. Uh, where are we? There it is. And it's on my screen, but I'm going to send it to your screen. So that is what the tool is looking like. Yeah. So, and usually the Z-Attack proxy runs its proxy on the port 8080. So I'm going to my web server, which is uh, the Firefox, also on my screen, but now on yours. So, and this is my website that I'm running here on my own computer. Yeah? So uh, the website is on uh, my own server, uh, on my own computer, and this is another project of OWASP. It's the OWASP Juice Shop. Very nice tool. We can look at it a little bit more in the uh, session if you want to. This is a training application to break into. This has like several flaws. You do that, you break into that. There is even a capture the flag if you want to like really do a, a game out of it and have teams compete on how many break-ins I can do. But that's like the application that I have. So we also have uh, a kind of a um, uh, um, yeah, buggy application with security holes that the set attack proxy can uh, show something on. So um, if I now configure my browser, to uh, use, so where is my mouse? There. The Z attack proxy that is running on the port 8080. Up. So, and I do OK. No, I have to click it. Do you see my mouse? I can't see my mouse. There it is. So, there we go. So, and if I now just reload the page, and click on something, and I'm going to submit something here. Yeah, pop. Yeah, and I close it. So all that should now register here. So you've seen that has been empty before, and any request has been like registered here, and I can like see all the calls I had. Here I can go and see the request in its fullest. I can see the response that it had. I have even the possibility to intercept requests and change them. And from the data that I'm giving here, Z already gives me the possibility to see the alerts that he's getting like from these five clicks already. And they're like here. So I have a session ID in the URL rewrite. Bad thing, yeah, if somebody steals my ID by uh, a cross-domain <laughs> JavaScript source file inclusion, yeah, uh, co no cache control, private IP disclosure. We're not protected against XSS. And this is, if I drill down into that in the report later, you will see this will end up in this URL is having that problem. And this is like the, the uh, solution to the problem that we recommend at OWASP. So it's like giving you a very good overview over the vulnerabilities you have. Is your cookie HTTP only? Uh, are you only using HTTPS? Uh, you can also use it via HTTPS, by the way. You have to do a little bit of extra to do that, but basically it also works on HTTPS. So it's really, really nice, really easy, uh, and really good to use. So this is nice for doing it click by click and hand by hand. So that's not automation, what I uh, um, uh, told you, promised you to show. So I just wanted to explain how the Z-Attack proxy works. So back to my uh, slides here. So that's not the thing. In the end, I get the report, of course. Yeah. So I get the report. I can download the report in HTML, Markdown, JSON, whatever I want to. So I have several formats. So, but automation is that not. So I can automate the browser, of course, by using Selenium. Selenium is a yeah, script-like interface to a headless uh, browser where I can like write my own tests. So often you write when you build a web application, uh, Selenium tests to, to do end-to-end -end tests. So, and if you want to automate your uh, security tests, you can use exactly these Selenium tests, or you have to write, at least for the main workflows, your Selenium tests. Yeah? Depends a little bit on the kind of application you're, you're using. So, and um, 
the Zap, this is why we chose Zap as a tool. There's different tools that do exactly that, that the same thing here. Um, the Zap has also a REST API. So I can use Zap without the application interface. Yeah? So there's no running application. It's just with the REST API. And with the REST API, I can also, with Selenium, automate like calls there, tell it to scan something, tell to do this, tell to do that, tell to download the report. And now the next or last step here is, since we in BizNode are already using Docker, this is rather easy. So we have the Selenium is running in Docker. No problem doing that. The um, uh, Z-Attack proxy also provides even a ready-made Docker image. You don't have to build anything on your own. So, and our application, that can run in Docker or not. So ours are running in Docker. That's why I, I uh, showed it up like that. But uh, basically, the left two things you can do in Docker easy. Yeah? And like most build and deploy servers or tools that you use, support Docker nowadays. So uh, we use Bamboo and Jenkins, and we can like use in those Docker images, uh, Docker containers, sorry, to start up the application and do the scan. If I have a little bit of time, yeah. So I can also show you how that would look like. Let me see it like that. Yeah, not like that, but like this. So, yeah, so here, I'm running the juice shop. That is the, the web application that you've seen already. It's running on port 3000, as you've seen. So that is basically what I've been requesting the whole time. So this is a headless Z-Attack proxy in a Docker container. So I'm running that. We can see now, then, uh, as the, the thing runs through, how it works. And here I have a Selenium Docker container. So basically, I have a Selenium script, very small. It's just going to the um, juice shop. It's clicking on a login button. It enters a username and a password. And then it's a, a click send. So that's all it does. So and if I do that, I run that. So I hope you all cross your fingers that it works now. I was having some problems. But basically, it's trying to reach the OWASP zap. It's starting that. It's exploring the application. So, and it took like four seconds to build up the Selenium, to click through the application and finish all the stuff. So, and the nice thing is we already have the report in. So if I go there again and look into, come on, this tab, yeah, that's the right one. So now I have this report here that was just created. Yeah, I put a timestamp on it, so the time zone is different on my computer. That's why it's like not showing the correct time. Yeah, and it's undefined. Thank you so for the good work. So kind of having a problem here, but usually we get like the report with all the alerts that we've seen there. So I can try to download it a second time. Let's see if it works then. But um, also, what I wanted to show, because I have like another script here, one, two, three, four. So there, I tell with the same Selenium API, the Z-Attack proxy to attack the juice shop that we've seen. So this is running a lot longer, so um, I don't know if we have the time to wait for that, but basically it's trying to attach. It's also like clicking through and logging in to show a little bit how the application works. And then it says, like, scan yourself. And then usually he gets, yeah. And you can see it's taking a lot longer than before. So that's why we're not doing an active scan every time we deploy. So we, we think about doing the Selenium test that will run like one, two, three, four, five minutes, like after each deploy on the QA. And we will do like this active scan like on major releases or like every month or something like that, because that can easily run up to an hour or two. So all, only in a small application like this, this will run like uh, two, two and a half minutes here. So it can run like half an hour or even an hour, depending on your application. OK, that's basically what I wanted to show. Yeah, so um, I'm getting back to the presentation here. 
at least that's what I want to do. So here. So um, for questions, I'll be available, and for um, further explanations, lo looking at the juice shop, looking at the Z attack proxy, looking at the REST API and stuff like that. Um, I'll be av available during the coffee breaks or in the workshop afterwards. I'm looking forward to discussing with you. I'd rather prefer having someone face to face and talking to them than presenting here, so I'm really looking forward to that. And uh, I hope you'll have a nice evening for all of you. Mulțumesc, which is another Romanian word I know.